Welcome to today's New England Hymns webinar, Analytics in 2022, Four Lessons Learned from the Pandemic, presented today by George Dealey, Vice President of Healthcare Solutions, and Gabrielle Amorosa, Lead Healthcare Business Intelligence Consultant with Dimensional Insights. All lines are muted upon entry today, so please send all your questions via the Q&A feature and we'll answer them at the end of the session. As Vice President of Healthcare Solutions, George sets the direction for Dimensional Insights Healthcare Solutions product line and leads the product development team. He is passionate about the possibilities for applying analytics technology to healthcare in ways that will improve the well being of both individuals and entire populations. Gabrielle Amorosa is a lead healthcare business intelligence consultant, where she has been a part of the healthcare applications team since 2019. She is involved with designing, developing, and maintaining a variety of healthcare applications, as well as working directly with hospitals and healthcare systems. Please join me in welcoming George and Gabrielle today. Thank you very much, Elisa. Great to be with you. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. We're very excited to talk to you about this topic, but we do have to apologize for pulling you back into COVID-19. We're certainly all tired of it, and we're, we're almost out of it. But as uh, professionals who work with data management and analytics uh, every day, we've been really intrigued by the role that information has played during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And we found some best practices uh, that we think are of general interest, but we think there's also an opportunity to apply these techniques and concepts uh, to things that you likely do with, with data and information every day. So we're looking forward to sharing those lessons and also some resources that we've put together uh, for you that we believe will, um, will help you understand how you can leverage these, these ideas in, in what you do. So we're gonna talk about four, four lessons and we'll jump right into it. So the role of, of information. So in the beginning of the pandemic, we had a lot of questions. Healthcare providers wanted to understand what resources would be required, which protocols and therapies were available and which ones were, were effective. And importantly, what they wouldn't be able to do as a result of, of taking care of COVID patients. Uh, at the community and policymaker level, uh, we needed to understand who COVID would affect, how quickly would it spread, how long would it last? And then for us, individuals, families, households, uh, caregivers, what were the risks? What precautions uh, could you take? How effective would they be? And could you trust the information or what information could you, could you trust? So this is an issue of, of trust. So how do we answer those, those questions? Uh, in a trustworthy and reliable way? Well, it comes down to, to data, information, evidence. So what do we have to, to work with here? So let's look at um, some of the potential sources of information. We have scientific research going all the way back to literally the 1700s and the initial primitive inoculations that were used for smallpox all the way through the advent of public health and Florence Nightingale in the mid 1800s, hundreds, and then using vaccines to combat a variety of infectious diseases in the in the 20th century. So there's a variety of there's a great foundation of research to build on. We've got diagnostic testing. We've got some very effective diagnostic tests for detecting uh, COVID-19. Uh, we have disease surveillance systems uh, in the U.S. Uh, put in place by the the CDC, but also some uh, more modern and sophisticated methods, methods such as wastewater uh, disease surveillance. And then we've got treatments and, and outcomes, uh, information on uh, both the, the treatments as well as the, uh, the outcomes, the effectiveness of those, of those treatments. So there's lots of information, there's almost an overwhelming amount of, of information. And it's a long ways from this very raw preliminary data to something that we can treat as, as the truth for decision making. So how do we close that gap? And that's really what we're going to talk about today. So we've got four lessons. First lesson is building a framework of truth around trusted data. So in each one of these sections, we're, we're gonna start with a, a series of, of questions to help us uh, understand the, the topic and the lesson. So first of all, trusted data. What does the data represent? Uh, how is that meaningful? Uh, how reliable is it? Can we trust it? How accessible is it? And how timely is it? 
And we're gonna answer each one of those questions uh, in our discussion. Uh, and we're gonna draw on some best practices that we've identified from throughout the, the pandemic. Now, as I go through the presentation, you'll notice that I'm gonna be clicking on various links. Uh, we'll, um, we're gonna deliver this presentation to you and you have all the resources that we'll be discussing uh, by clicking on, uh, on a link or an image, or sometimes we'll have a reference at the, at the bottom of the, the page. So um, our resources, uh, just to uh, go through them quickly, Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, the New York Times, the US Centers for Disease Control and, um, and Prevention, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, the World Health Organization, and then a nonprofit, Our World in Data, that compiles information on COVID and other health-related uh, issues from around the, the world. So let's talk first about the meaning of data. And it's helpful to broadly characterize data into a, a, few, a few groups, a few categories. And one of the most important ones is, is outcomes, uh, the, the consequence of the phenomena that we're studying. And in the case of COVID-19, we've got the infection, the COVID-19 infection itself. Then we have the consequence of, of that, hospitalizations and deaths being two of the, the primary outcomes measures. The other broad category would be the indicators and, and signals that will help us understand uh, outcomes. And those include uh, symptoms, physical symptoms, uh, the results of diagnostic tests, uh, once we begin to compile this information, the patterns that we see in regional and demographic trends, and then the precautionary measures that we've uh, put into place to protect ourselves uh, against the, the infection. And then we have infections again. So infections are both a, a signal that will help us understand uh, the other outcomes, the hospitalizations and deaths, uh, but they're also, they're a signal and an outcome. So we can think, think of uh, an infection as, as an outcome. All right, so we, talk, we started by talking about meaning. So how do we get specific? And that's really the, the realm and the, the role of, of governance. So we need to start with some basic understanding of the measurements, the metrics that we have available, but then we need to begin to define them initially at a, a fairly elementary level, uh, just to provide accessibility to the information. So we're gonna draw on our uh, best practice example here, starting with the, uh, the New York Times. So the New York Times on their, um, both in their reporting in their GitHub repository, where they actually make the information behind their reporting available, they start with these very high level definitions around some of the primary measurements um, used in, in uh, COVID-19. So cases and deaths, confirmed cases, confirmed deaths, probable cases, and, and the list go, goes on. But that's not enough. In order to, to do analysis and draw conclusions from this information, we need, need to take it down to a more specific level. So here's an example from the, uh, again, the Times GitHub repository, and it describes confirmed cases. So confirmed cases are accounts of individuals whose coronavirus infections were confirmed by a laboratory test and reported by a federal, state, territorial, or state government agency. And the only tests that detect viral RNA in a sample are considered confirmatory. And these are often called the, uh, the PCR tests. Okay, that's a pretty clear definition. That's, that's pretty helpful. However, things change over, over time. So early in the pandemic, when we were beginning to gain an understanding of coronavirus infections, we got some additional guidance from a trusted panel of experts. So in April, 2020, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists advised the states, or actually composed of the states and the localities who uh, report the information, advised the states to include both confirmed cases based on a confirmed laboratory test, as well as probable cases based on specific criteria for testing symptoms and exposure. And the Centers for Disease Control uh, adopted these definitions in their reporting and began including both, as did the, the Times in their reporting. So that's an example of dealing with the, uh, the inherent changes that we're gonna see as we gain a better understanding of the phenomena that we're, we're studying. So let's shift gears a little bit subtly from governance to curation. So curation is, is matching up these 
uh, very carefully defined definitions with the actual data itself and trying to resolve things like uh, ambiguity, inconsistency in reporting, and the fact that um, tabulation counting methods may change over time. So here's an example of a potentially uh, ambiguous definition. So probable deaths. So probable deaths are deaths where COVID-19 is listed on a, a death certificate as a cause of death or a significant contributing condition, um, but where there's been no confirmatory laboratory test. So that's pretty straightforward, right? We see COVID-19 listed on the death certificate or we don't. But then the definition goes on to say that deaths among probable cases tracked by a state, local health department where a death certificate has not been filed may also be counted as a probable death. So there it begins to get a little bit fuzzy. So uh, how do we use this in our analysis? And we're also dealing with the fact here that this can create a controversy and confusion. So the thing that the Times did in this case to curate or further describe um, this probable deaths measure is to refer to their own reporting. So they cite in their GitHub repository, this article, is the coronavirus death tally inflated or not? And they start with the political, political controversy. But then as we go further down here, we've actually got a very detailed explanation of how deaths are counted uh, in the public health vital statistics area. And they use an example in the state of Washington and a chronology. So we won't actually read through this, but the point is that there's a lot of detailed information in this report to really inform our understanding of something that is really inherently ambiguous. So here's another, here's another facet of curation. So what happens when, uh, when things change and we have exceptions? So again, this is from the Times. Um, in New York, there were some changes and they changed the way that um, deaths were counted in New York State several times in a response to both how the, the State um, Department of Public Health and or the Health Department and New York City reported their, their data. So how do we deal with this? Or how did the Times deal with it as a curator of that information? So we'll go back to their GitHub repository, which again, we think is a best practice example of how you deal with both the governance, but also the curation and the fact that things are gonna change over the, the course of time. So we start with a general description of the, the methodology, how the methodology changed over time, and then a chronology of those changes. So why is this important? Well, when we begin to inv investigate and do our analysis, now we're gonna try to draw conclusions. Well, what if we draw conclusions on information that's, that's changing as a report of a change, uh, change in the reporting method, but doesn't actually uh, reflect the phenomena, phenomena itself? We wouldn't wanna do that. So this governance and curation is very important from the perspective of really what's understanding what's going on underneath the, the data. Okay, so, so far we've talked about governance and curation. We're gonna to shift to uh, a few other dimensions of trusted data. So timeliness and access. So one of the advantages of information in the COVID era is the fact that it has been available on a timely basis. And that's allowed us to make uh, data-driven decisions, you know, if not in, in real time, you know, within a day or so of the information becoming available. So we wanna shift our best practice example now from the New York, New York Times over to Johns Hopkins and the Coronavirus Resource Center. So what I'm gonna show here is a little clip from a daily report. This is something that Johns Hopkins makes available every day. And it's a snapshot of what's going on in the coronavirus from a, 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 from a data perspective. And the point of showing this is to help you understand currency, the data, and the advantage of having information available uh, daily.
I think you'll agree that's a lot of information in 60 seconds and it's updated every day. So we certainly have the advantage of timeliness. And I think that little clip showed the power of uh, animation and visualization in terms of putting that timely data into context, seeing trends evolve uh, day to day. So we've got good timeliness. How about access? So when we talk about access, we're talking about the, the access to this information to a broad audience, not just the scientists and professionals, but as many as people as can make, uh, make use of the information. So we're looking at four um, of our best practices resources. And each one of them provides information through an interactive website. We just looked at an example from Johns Hopkins. But in addition to that, and that, that is important because it provides summarized information. And you know, typically they'll draw conclusions from their analysis on that information. But in addition to that, they've also made the data that they use for their reporting and analysis and summarization available publicly. So why is that important? That means that we don't have to necessarily trust the you know, summarized um, analysis of the information or even the conclusions completely. We can use the data, assuming we trust it. We've been talking about trust. Assuming we trust the data, we can do our own analysis and try to replicate uh, the conclusions or uh, see if we agree with the conclusions based on our own analysis of the data. Um, and the fact that the data that's being reported actually overlaps among um, these uh, four different um, reporting, um, um, reporting sources means that we can compare them to one another for an additional level of, of validation. All right, so far we've talked about how we build this framework of trust around information so that we can both understand it and trust it. So now we're gonna to move to our second lesson and Gabrielle. Thank you, George. So let's talk now about how we can harness the power of visualization in meaningful ways. So the questions that we'll talk about in this section are, which visualizations are appropriate and <clears throat> compelling? What's the purpose of the visualization? Which of course ties in very closely to question one. Um, and who can benefit, benefit and who might we be excluding with our choice of visualization? Okay, so let's talk, of, let's start by talking about the power of simplicity in visualizations. So here we have uh, a visualization that depicts the course of an Omicron infection from exposure through recovery from the New York Times. So it's apparent that this is intended to be very simple. We don't have numerical labels on the, on the axes. And the intention of this visualization is not to be able to say, okay, on day X, my viral load is Y. This really serves as an educational resource for people to understand what they're about to go through if they've just been exposed to Omicron. So this really gives people the perspective of, all right, I'm going to become infectious um, a little while after I'm exposed, but a little bit before I develop symptoms, if symptoms appear. So what's powerful about that is that, you know, a more advanced audience member who maybe has um, an academic interest in this subject can use this as a jumping off point to look at more detailed data from some of those sources that we just talked about. And for a layperson who's just trying to figure out what this means for their own personal risk or their household risk, um, this really empowers them to ask the next important questions, maybe give their PCP a call um, now that they're armed with this information. So for that purpose, this is an incredibly effective visualization. Next, let's look at something a little bit more complex. So these charts accompany an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and the information in this article is actually the basis for that first visualization we looked at from the New York Times. Um, so here we can see that we have significantly more detail. Um, we have detail la detailed labels on our axes. We see individual data points in addition to trend lines. Um, we have confidence intervals. This is intended for a different audience. This visualization is really powerful for someone who's actually going to read this research article or who has a level of comfort and curiosity um, with this level of data and analysis. So it's still very useful in its own right, 
but it's not as broadly applicable as the first graph we looked at. However, that first incredibly helpful chart uh, would not be possible without first creating these types of visualizations. Switching gears a little bit, let's talk about how familiar patterns can be helpful in choosing visualizations. So it probably jumps right off the page that we are looking at a map of the United States divided by traditional state boundaries. Um, and here we happen to be looking at the frequency with which states report their COVID-19 case data from Johns Hopkins. Um, so what's really powerful about conveying data in this way is that we can pretty quickly see regional trends emerge in the measure we are looking at, um, which would not be as apparent if this data was displayed in a chart or table. So by using something that's pretty uni universally recognizable, we can convey a lot of meaning um, without you know, having to display uh, an excessive amount of data. We can extend this concept and this best practice to think about using familiar patterns in series. So um, here, instead of looking at just one measure of interest, we're able to look at four. So not only can we um, identify regional trends for a single measure, but we can start to make connections and conclusions about measures that may be related, um, all you know, without getting into too much detail, this is still very accessible for a wide range of audiences because we're using something that's so immediately recognizable. Um, so to extend this idea a little bit, this is a newer type of visualization that's becoming popular. And it's not as apparent immediately what we're looking at, but if we look at this for a second, we see that we are still arranging the information um, in a regional manner. So we are still able to identify those location-based trends. Each square, um, the shade of each square corresponds to the current value of a measure. And within each square, we also see the historical trend of that measure. So again, this is going to be really powerful for people who have a level of comfort um, with these types of visualizations and can parse out what this means. Um, there's absolutely a time and place for this type of visualization, but it's worth noting that this will um, not be quite as accessible as the past two examples we looked at with a, a more traditional map structure. And finally, you've probably seen a lot of time series um, over the past two years. And the reason is that they're just exceptionally good at um, conveying information. So what we're looking at here is confirmed COVID-19 deaths from March 2020 through February 2022. Um, and we are able to also look at multiple countries at once. So even though there's a lot of information on this graph, it's still pretty understandable and accessible. The real power of this visualization is that we have the ability to make a lot of modifications to how we're viewing this data. So let's say I'm finding it a little bit overwhelming to look at so many lines at once. I can narrow this down. So maybe I just wanna look at the US, Canada, and the UK. Um, and this is a little bit easier for me to parse and process. If I want some specific numbers and specific dates, I can hover over the lines um, and get those values in the little pop-up box there. This graph pretty clearly shows the various surges we've experienced, um, including those due to variants like Delta and Omicron. On the bottom, I have the option to toggle the time frame that I'm looking at. So if I want to look at specifically the Omicron surge and see um, that, that data in more granularity, I have that option as well. For more advanced users, I can also change the metric I'm looking at. So instead of confirmed deaths, I could look at cases or a variety of other interesting KPIs. I can change the interval, um, and I can also toggle the scale between linear and logarithmic. So what's really um, impressive about this visualization is that it has a, a low floor and a high ceiling. So it's understandable and accessible to a broad range of audiences, and it's still incredibly useful to more advanced um, data, data users and data analysts. So if we go back to our slide, um, 
In this section, we talked, um, you know, about some more innovative um, types of visualizations. Certainly, there is still many appropriate times and places for more traditional visualizations like pie charts, bar graphs, line graphs. Um, but today, we want to focus on some other ways that we could use powerful visualizations to consider our audience um, and choose effective uh, and equitable visualizations. So with that, we are going to move on to lesson three and I'll pass it back to George. So we've talked about trusted data, data that we can analyze in a confident way. We've looked at some visualization tools. Now we wanna apply those, that data and those tools to the realm of analysis, but also we wanna translate the ana analysis in a very practical way. So what can we do with our, our analysis tools and techniques? Well, first and very importantly, we need to validate the data to make sure that we can trust it. Then we wanna ask what questions can it answer? And then what are some of the patterns in the data that might be useful? So let's start with validation. So we're kind of working under the premise here that we're, we're using trusted data. We worked really hard to get trusted data, but do we wanna trust the source of that data? Well, one of the things we can do with our analysis tools is to look at various things to assure ourselves that we can indeed trust the data. And a few examples of that would be missing data. So if you look, we look at the, the data chronologically in terms of time, uh, we might see some patterns jump out in terms of uh, periods that are missing. Uh, if we go into the data, in terms of categorical subsets, we might be able to um, identify some missing data that way. We have measurement error, measurement error. We have some very good diagnostic tests for COVID-19, but me measurement error is inherent in any time, kind, type of test. So we need to be aware that it's most likely present. Um, a lot of the data, both in the US and from around the world, is uh, tabulated and reported by hand. So there's no doubt that there's some level of data entry error. And then we can use our analysis tools to look for outliers, particularly the really big outliers. And we'll find them, uh, find that they're a consequence of maybe measurement error, data ent entry errors, but also maybe the phenomena that we're trying to understand. Now, in the case of measurement and data entry errors, if we can convince ourselves that they're truly errors, we might actually want to remove them from the data. But if they're actually part of the phenomena that we're studying, COVID-19 in this case, we probably want to leave them in. Now, we may want to use some analytical techniques to dampen their effect on our analysis, but we probably don't want to throw them out because the, the nature of information is that we're never going to get it perfect, right? And the longer we wait, um, the less timely the, the data is going to be. So we're ultimately gonna to need to strike a balance here and determine what's good enough. Now, once we've made that decision, what are some of the analytical tools and techniques that we can apply? And we're gonna look at three of them. So the first is a pretty simple concept, but a very powerful one, and that's moving averages. So we're looking here at a chart of daily cases per um, 100,000 of population. And if we look at the information that is reported daily, it's very spiky, particularly in the Omicron surge, which does a great job of, uh, of demonstrating the day-to-day -day variation here. Now, if we tried to make sense of this, uh, that pattern, we would have a very difficult time, right? Um, probably we'd have a difficult time even drawing a conclusion as to what's going on day to day, but we certainly uh, wouldn't be able to get to any level of statistical significance. Why is that? Well, we got a pretty good idea that it has to do with reporting lag as we just looked at. So instead, we can use a seven day moving average, which is used for most of the COVID measures. Sometimes we'll, we'll see 14 day averages or, or other averages, but seven days is, is pretty common. And it kind of gives us perspective across an entire week, which is really the reporting cycle for this, this information as we look across those reporting frequencies. So what does that moving average do? Well, it gives us a much clearer idea of the trend through this data. We can see the surges, uh, we can see Omicron. In fact, the interesting thing about this is that the seven-day moving average does a really nice job of highlighting that trend of, go, of infection rates going up really quickly, peak, uh, peaking, and coming back down again. So 
moving average used consistently in, in reporting on COVID, but uh, certainly other diseases as well. Very powerful, very easy to apply mathematically. Now let's look at our second example. So we're looking at two charts here and we're comparing two cohorts across two measurements. So our measurements are average daily cases and average daily deaths. Our cohorts are the unvaccinated and the fully vaccinated populations. So let's look at the trend that's unfolding over time for average daily cases. So in the case of the unvaccinated population, uh, we see a surge, come back down again. And then in the Omicron timeframe, we see the infection rate going up again. If we look at the vaccinated population, uh, we do see a little bump here. It comes back down. And then during Omicron, we've got a big surge in infections, uh, likely at this point, we know, due to breakthrough infections. Okay, so now let's go over to average daily deaths and look at the patterns there. So we have a very similar pattern between cases and deaths in the unvaccinated population. Peak comes down and begins to go up again during the, uh, the Omicron period. Now we compare that to the uh, fully vaccinated population and we see it staying very low. And then during Omicron, it's really not moving up um, in the way that the, uh, the infection rate did. So, there's a few things that we can do here. One is just by using these visualizations, we can compare one chart to the other, but we have to be very careful. So if we look at the scales here, you know they're both measured in terms of cases per 100,000 of population. But look at the scale here. This line is 100 cases per 100,000. Over here, this line is two deaths per 100,000. So if we're not careful, we could look across these two uh, two charts and uh, and conclude that there are actually more deaths than cases, which wouldn't make any sense as well. Now that's an extreme example, but there are real subtleties among visualizations that we have to be careful of, both in terms of int interpreting them, but also if we're if we're the party uh, responsible for presenting them, making sure that we present them in a in a fair way. And the interesting thing about these charts and this analysis, and this is based on research uh, that came from the Centers for Disease Control and reported by the, the New York Times. Um, the interesting thing that the Times does with this chart is that they annotate it to really bring out the, the message behind the charts. And that's that in the average daily, uh, daily case rate, you now we have a difference of uh, two times, a factor of two uh, in the Omicron surge. If we go over to the death rate, um, it's very different. It's a factor of 20 versus a factor of two. And that's the, that's the real message behind these, these charts. Now, one of the things that we wanna do is to analyze the information um, objectively um, without jumping to conclusions. And we wanna be skeptical of, of the data. So I might say, all right, um, I understand your, your perspective here, but we're looking at just the COVID population. Now, some of the folks who, who died in this measure over here, um, maybe they were at the end of their life anyway, and let's say that you know, COVID-19 was responsible for their, their death, but they really just, it just accelerated it. Did it really have, or does COVID-19 really have an impact on deaths across the entire population? And that's a very fair question to, to ask. So let's look at um, death and mortality from a different perspective. And we'll, we change our lens here to the measure of ex excess deaths. And we're looking at a chart here um, from the CDC that beginning in um, early 2018, looks at the pattern of deaths across the population. Now, this is the entire US population number of deaths. So it's not a population ratio, but assuming that the population doesn't change too dramatically, um, it, it suffices as a good measure. So we can see a very clear seasonal pattern here from year to year, the deaths go um, up and down. And we, do, we would expect that trend to continue over time, but it didn't. The number of deaths began to increase um, earlier, a few months into, into the COVID, COVID period. So we may still raise the question of, okay, the number of deaths went up in this period right here. Now, could it have been coincidental? Could it have been attributable to some other factor? 
So let's actually take a look at this visualization on the CDC website. Oh, thank you, maybe later. And first of all, get to what we're looking at. So this is the same visualization we just looked at, but we're, we're gonna change our perspective a little bit. So we were looking at weekly excess deaths. Now let's look at it with and without COVID-19. So what changes? It's the same data, but the green represents non-COVID deaths and the blue represent COVID deaths. So there's a very close um, correlation or correspondence between the surge and the number of deaths that were attributable to COVID. In fact, very clearly, it's pretty much all of the deaths that are above the, the expected rate. And if we wanna understand exactly what deaths are being counted in each of those categories, uh, we can look at the notes here. We can understand the fact that there are significant lags in reporting and understand which deaths are actually being, being counted here. So there's a lot of good information that gets back to our points about governance and, and curation. All right, let's go to our final example, what's, which gets into an area that's um, a little bit more complex and admittedly confusing, even if you work in this area day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, these, these ideas can be quite abstract. So this is the area of sensitivity and specificity. And these are ways of measuring the effectiveness of uh, a diagnostic test. That's one of the applications. And we have this concept of sensitivity, which detects the, the presence of a condition. We refer, refer to that as the true positive. And specificity, which detects the absence of a condition, which is the true negative. Now, the nature of tests is that there's always a balance. If we want more of one, if we want more sensitivity, for example, we're probably gonna have to trade off specificity, but we need to maintain a balance. So this chart, this visualization here, which um, goes by the incredibly intuit intuitive name of the area under the receiving operator characteristic curve. If you can even say that you're ahead of the game, let alone let alone understand what it, what it means, but it's actually a very effective tool and you don't need to understand the calculus behind it to get something out of it. So what we're looking at here with these four curves is curve D means that the test is basically a coin flip. It does not have very good uh, predictive power, uh, but it's neither sensitive nor specific. Now curve A, which isn't really a curve, it's just an L, that is the perfect test. It has perfect sensitivity and perfect specificity. Now, we very rarely achieve that in a test. Most of our tests are in between. Test B, it's a pretty good test. It does a good job of balancing sensitivity and specificity. Uh, test C, not quite as good, still a lot better than, than a coin flip. So, with that information, with these concepts, how can we apply these in a practical way? So our objective in this lesson is to take these various analytical techniques and apply them practically. So we can look, the, look at the characteristics of our two primary COVID tests, the PCR or molecular test, which is a very good test. It's considered the, the gold standard for COVID-19, has both very high specificity and high, very high sensitivity, well into the, the high 90s for, for both of these. So it's good at detecting the, the presence and it's good at detecting the, the absence, both true positives and true negatives, a very high percentage of the, of the results. But it does have its drawbacks, right? Um, the specimen has to be uh, collected properly. It's gotta be process, uh, processed by a, a professional lab. And there's a turnaround time that can be anywhere from a, a day, if you're lucky, uh, to several days to even longer when there, was a, when there was a backlog. So the alternative has been the antigen or the, the rapid test. Still a reasonably good test, especially when it comes to detecting the presence of COVID. So it's got, it's got good sensitivity, but not quite as good on the specificity side. Now, what does that mean? That means that there's a an somewhat significant number of false negatives. So we've got to take that into account when we're analyzing the, the results of that test. Now, by the same token, the rapid test has the advantage of being both accessible, uh, particularly now you can get your hands on them fairly easily. And the turnaround time is all, almost instant, it's within minutes compared to, to days. 
All right, so we've got an understanding of the, the power of these tests and the advantages and the disadvantages. How do we apply these uh, this at a practical level? So we can overlay this knowledge on something that we looked at a little bit earlier with uh, Gabrielle's chart. And this is the, the uh, life cycle of an infection as we look at viral load go up and then come back down again. But we can look at when the, uh, the molecular tests and the rapid tests are most effective. And we can see that the, the PCR, the molecular test, is effective over a broader span throughout this life cycle, whereas the rapid test, it takes a higher viral load in order to, uh, to trigger the, the effectiveness of the, of the test. And that pattern changes a little bit with, with Omicron. So we've got to be very careful in terms of, of both when we use the test as well as how we interpret the, the results. Now, speaking of practical, I can relate some personal experience here. Uh, I had COVID uh, a few weeks ago. My entire household had COVID. I was the last one to have. So I was exposed to COVID um, for a period of about five days or so when I started developing symptoms. So it made sense to get tested then. So uh, we were able to, able to get our hands on a, a rapid test. And as I was in the first day or so of symptoms, uh, that's when uh, I took my first rapid test and it was negative. There was no line. If you've used the rapid test, you're familiar with this. There was no line whatsoever. You used a magnifying glass to try to find indication. There was nothing, right? So what does that mean? Does that mean I didn't have COVID? Well, kind of using the knowledge uh, that we've gained here, we know that there's a pretty uh, high likelihood that that might have been a false negative, that I actually had COVID, but the rapid test didn't pick up on it. So this was early, or I guess a little bit into Omicron, and the guidance that was emerging was wait 48 hours or so and take another test. Because as we can see here, if my viral load were still going up, the rapid test would do a better job of, of detecting the, the presence of of COVID or maybe the absence of it if I if I didn't have it. Um, so indeed, I waited uh, I waited a couple of days, took the test again, and the results were clearly very positive. Now I was a few days into symptoms at that point, um, so it was pretty clear that I, I had COVID. But in the meantime, um, how could I use this information? So I had a negative test. Should I assume that I was actually negative? Well, given the high rate of false negatives and the fact that maybe I took the test a little bit on the early side, I was probably safer to assume that I actually had COVID than I didn't have COVID. And there's a lot of practical applications of this information. You know, if I were to visit a, uh, a relative who might have been uh, particularly vulnerable to, to COVID, I probably wouldn't want to count on a single uh, rapid test. I might want to get a PCR test instead or take a series of rapid tests, increase my confidence that I actually didn't have, have COVID. And there's lots more information available on sensitivity and specificity as it applies to diagnostic tests. Um, we've included a resource from Johns Hopkins here that provides some additional inf information. All right, so we've talked about trusted data, visualization tools, how we apply those tools in analysis and some practical ways to apply them. Let's move to our fourth and final lesson. Okay, so this may seem like um, an abrupt change to be talking about communicating in ways that resonate. Uh, and really our motivation here is if we think back to the first three lessons, even if we have flawless data, um, and accurate and accessible visualizations, um, and we can do wonderful analysis on, on all of those things, uh, which first of all, none of those things happen in the real world. We know that that's still not going to be sufficient. Crazy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We know that that's still not going to be sufficient um, to convince all audiences. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time just thinking about what do we need to consider in the realm of communication about all of this great data that we've now um, gathered and validated and visualized? Okay, so some of the questions we'll think about in the section are, what is the message? Who is the audience? Are we trying to incite an action or inspire a change in behavior? What obstacles exist either to, um, our audience accessing our message or being receptive to what we're saying? And what are some of the components of an effective message? 
So to start, we're gonna bring it all the way back to high school English and talk a little bit about the rhetorical triangle. So this concept dates back to Aristotle and it's a framework for thinking about the different ways in which an audience um, receives and interacts with a message. So we have ethos, which is the ethics and credibility of the person or body delivering the message. Logos, the logic and reason, which is what we've been talking about on this webinar so far. And pathos, which is the emotional connection we have to the subject of a message. So logos, logic and reasoning. Um, so this uh, refers to the data and the evidence um, piece of a message or argument. Probably many of us on this call respond really positively to evidence-based persuasion. Um, and every persuasive message should absolutely contain good, verifiable data and analysis. However, that's not going to be equally persuasive to all audiences, which is valid. So we need to make sure that this cornerstone is solid, but it's not the only thing we rely on when we're trying to communicate about all this data we put so much great work into. The next thing we want to think about is pathos. So even for those of us who um, respond really well to data and evidence, we're all human and we filter the messages we receive through our emotional connection to a subject. One example of how we can use this to really open the door to a conversation with someone who may not respond in the same way to logic and reason um, is thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic and the multiple instances when frontline healthcare workers appealed directly to the public um, in regards to COVID-19 safety and precautions. They had a, and still have, a unique, um, a unique perspective and a unique emotional authority to speak on what they were seeing in terms of treating patients, what those patients' families were going through, and also the ongoing trauma that healthcare workers were experiencing being on the front lines for so long. And that's a powerful tool to open the lines of communication. And finally, we have the ethos, the ethics and credibility of who's delivering the message. So one example here would be Dr. Anthony Fauci, who for the majority of the pandemic has been the federal government's leading spokesperson on um, strategy and response. But not everyone who's delivering these messages or who's credible to deliver these messages necessarily holds the same type of formal title. So other folks we would wanna remember and consider would be um, family physicians, community and local government leaders, um, and religious leaders. So really the idea in focusing on the rhetorical triangle here is just to remember that, you know, what we focus on in our day-to-day -day and what we've talked about in this call is making sure we have great, understandable, accessible data. Um, and to do justice to that message, we also need to um, just consider the other ways that people respond to messaging and try to make sure we have um, an entry point for everyone into that conversation. And the final concept we want to talk about with communication is this idea of data literacy. So the COVID-19 pandemic was interesting in the sense that it was the first time that many people were able to witness the scientific process play out in real time, where we're adapting our approach as data comes in. Um, if we think back to, say, March of 2020, at the time, uh, what scientists knew about historical Coronaviruses is that they tended to spread through surface contact and through droplets. So appropriately, the messaging was really focused on social distancing, hygiene, and um, leaving masks for frontline healthcare workers. As we got new and better data, it became apparent that masking was going to be one of our most effective strategies to prevent catastrophic spread of COVID until vaccines became widely available. However, for some people, um, that felt sudden. And if there isn't an educational piece to go along with, you know, why are we making this change? How does this work? What's the underlying reasoning? Um, that can lead to distrust of public health messaging that, that has some long range consequences. Um, so it's just important to remember that we can't necessarily assume a certain level of data literacy in our target audience. Um, and that we, we wanna provide an entry point to everyone into that conversation and that message and make sure there's a focus on the education piece as well. So what do we do about all of that? 
Of course, some responsibility falls on science communicators, public health experts, individual healthcare providers, and government officials um, to consider what goes into effective messaging. However, we all have a role to play. There have been a lot of great resources developed over the past two years to help lay people, or even people like me who work cl closely with healthcare data, but don't hold a medical degree and don't work on the front lines. Um, to have productive, respectful conversations with friends and family who might have questions or hesitancies about the latest guidelines and really meet them where they're at in that conversation. So what we really want to emphasize in this fourth and final lesson is no one really knows how to do all of this perfectly. Um, but, you know, we've worked so hard to understand what's going on and to work on getting out of this pandemic together. And part of that is going to be um, a focus on effective communication. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to George for a final wrap up. OK, so we've looked at four lessons and just to quickly review what they were first, build a framework of truth around trusted data. That's the basis for everything that we'll do with information, then harness the power of visualization use those tools to translate analysis into some practical applications and then finally communicate in ways that that resonate so we're at 50 minutes and we've left some time for questions and discussion and we hope that you have some okay so let's we don't have let's any questions i was going to say if you have any questions go ahead and put them in the q a for george and gabrielle at this time and I'm sorry, George, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'll go ahead and let you have the floor. That's, that's quite okay, Lisa. So we, we, we do have one question to, to start the discussion. And that's, a oh, okay, so we've been talking about COVID information as, at a somewhat abstract level across the entire population, across the entire US and, and, and the world. Um, what are some examples of ways that um, this information can be applied at a, at a practical level. And we'll, we'll use some examples from working with our, our own customers on this. So early on in the pandemic, um, several of our customers uh, came to us asking if we could help in terms of taking information from their systems, their electronic uh, health records and other systems to compile that information in ways that would allow them to make real-time decisions uh, around providing providing care. And some of the things that they were most interested in were what's the what are the availability, what's the availability, availability of critical resources, everything from um, protective, personal protective equipment to um, hospital beds, uh, certain types of, of beds, such as the beds in uh, negative pressure rooms and uh, critical care units. Uh, what's the census uh, within the hospital? What's the ability of the, the hospital to, uh, to deal with maybe the current census or maybe if there's a surge, um, additional uh, patients beyond what the hospital could, could accommodate. And we, we found as a pattern uh, across our customers that this information was very, very useful. Not something that they had necessarily considered doing before, uh, but it was the type of thing that actually could be, be put in place fairly quickly and was very useful. So. It actually connected the the dots, which frankly can be a little bit abstract in terms of you know this whole idea of uh, analysis, business intelligence, whatever however you refer to it. Now, how is that practical um, at the front lines level? And I think uh, one of the things that COVID has done is provided some very clear examples in terms of the advantages of having uh, information in real time, or at least very timely information. Uh, presented in ways that it can be interpreted by uh, a broad audience, say, you know, within a provider organization, but but even beyond that. Uh, so, you know, we certainly got some firsthand experience there in terms of you know, how to make uh, this type of information very practical and, and very actionable. And we just had another question come in from Pat. Thanks for all the links for resources. Do you have a favorite? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I would say to that is um, they're not siloed, right? I mean, we saw how, for example, the data in the New England Journal of Medicine inspired um, and informed the creation of that chart that the New York Times was using. So I think they're all great in their own regard and for their own um, purposes. I mean, personally, I checked the New York Times COVID dashboard 
pretty much every day. That's the one that I send to my family. Um, so I think that they do a great job of summarizing things at an uh, understandable level. Um, but I think that they all have a, a time and place based on kind of what you're looking to get out of the information. You can detect a little bit of a, a bias here. <laughs> we both agree on the New York Times. And they have uh, they have devoted a huge amount of resources, time and effort from the beginning of the pandemic to compile the information in a reliable way. And I think present it in um, in ways that really do represent uh, best best practices. And it's something that they're good at to begin with. Um, but I, th I think they have become one of the you know, real trusted sources of this information. And you may or may not agree with their interpretation or their editorial position, but you can go back to the data. And I think the, the data, particularly as you uh, compare what's available from the, the Times and other sources, you know, you'll see a very high level of continuity. And you know, as, we, as we discussed in our examples, you know, they really have done what I think is a first class example around governance and, and curation. Uh, so that you know, if you do look at the raw data and you want to um, draw conclusions from it, you can go to you can go to the reporting, you can go to that GitHub site, and understand what's going on be behind the data. So that before you draw a conclusion, you can understand if there's maybe something else going on be uh, behind the the COVID nineteen phenomena. Well, we don't have any more questions in the Q&A right now, um, and we just have a few minutes left at the hour. I want to thank George and Gabrielle, um, our first side-by-side -side presenters during COVID. As you keep seeing them looking at each other, it's, it's, it's very interesting <laughs> that for the first time, now that we're going back into offices to have presenters sitting side-by-side, -side, it's fantastic. Um, thank you for joining us today, and they are um, participate. They do participate as a, one of our premier sponsors with Dimensional Insight. And um, as George mentioned, the presentation handout will be sent along with the CP Hymns credit um, that will go out via email to you tomorrow. And um, please take a moment as you exit our um, session today to give us your feedback on the online survey. Um, Gabrielle and George would look forward to hearing from you. And um, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. And, and before have we go, Lisa, stay we did have one there. final oh, message sure. from our, our sponsor, just sure. for folks ahead, who George. may not be familiar with Dimensional Insight. Uh, so yes, the sponsor would be, would be us, Gabrielle, Gabrielle and I, uh, are part of the healthcare team at Dimensional Insight. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, Dimensional Insight is a software development firm and creator of the award-winning diver analytics platform. And our healthcare team uses that technology to build healthcare specific uh, applications, analytical applications. And the response from our customers who use those applications in independent surveys has helped us to win the much sought after best in class award in our case for business intelligence and analytics an unprecedented uh, eight times as you see here in the, in the slide. And that success comes from our deep domain experience in healthcare coupled with technical capabilities and know-how uh, combined into a repeatable methodology that's designed to ensure successful outcomes. So if you're struggling with analytics or just trying to figure out how to move forward, we'd love to talk to you. And I'll add, as uh, Alicia mentioned, we're a longtime sponsor and supporter of HIMSS, both at the, uh, the national and the New England level. So again, thanks very much. If you do have additional questions, you'd like to continue the conversation, please feel free to e email either Gabrielle or myself. Our email addresses are on this slide, the last slide of the presentation that you'll receive. George, there is one more question that popped into the chat while you were um, closing out there, and we have one minute. Um, Sarah asks, I have a quick question related to the timeliness of the data. How rigorously is data inspected prior to becoming available to the public, and how are data quality measures ensured in these instances? Uh, that, that's a great question. In fact, if I didn't mention it, I, I meant to, and that's that there's a trade-off between timeliness and the quality and validity of the of the data and i think you know as you as you read about the reporting process and reliability there is a tremendous amount of variation as you go from region to region and in fact the uh, the new york times actually has done a pretty good job um, looking at the validity of validity of the data in fact what the times does is to, uh, they are in touch with the reporting entities, typically at the, 
the county and the state level. And they actually look at the validity for things like missing data and inconsistencies. And again, if you go to the, uh, the New York Times GitHub site, uh, there's a lot of information there in terms of how they deal with things like missing data and inconsistency. So the data is reported on a daily basis. Uh, it is corrected over time. And so I, it, depending on the state, in some cases it's revised retroactively. In other cases, uh, it's incorporated into current data. But um, I would say go out to that, um, um, that GitHub site and you'll get a much better understanding as to how that balance is, is struck. Well, thank you, George, for taking the time to answer that last question. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And um, have a great week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.